If you have your Bibles this morning, it's going to... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I like that. So yeah, I'm testing you out. Uh, a, good, a good crowd here this morning. Most churches I ask that too, and I watch them fumble around trying to find a Bible. All right. All right, Acts chapter 16 this morning. We're going to go a little off um, off the beaten path today. Uh, we're normally on the fruit of the Spirit, but I want to do a special message this morning. Um, the Lord's put on my heart to do. Acts chapter 16. And uh, if you want a title for this message, uh, What Does Hinder You From Being Saved? We're going to talk about that this morning because there's a lot of hindrances out here that the devil puts in our pathway to keep us from either being saved, uh, if you're lost, you're, you know, the devil's got all kinds of excuses for you to keep you away from Jesus Christ, and if you're saved, he's got all kinds of excuses for you to keep you from doing what God wants you to do. So he's got, he's got something for everybody, trust me. Acts chapter 16, we're going to start in verse 25. The Bible says, And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loose. The keeper of the prison awake out of his sleep, Seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spoke unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. When it was day, the magistrate sent the sergeant, saying, Let those men go. I'll preach you a message this morning on hindrances. What does hinder you from being saved? Now I want you to notice in this passage this morning that it says that it was at midnight. Midnight is the darkest part of the night. Midnight is the part of the night that is completely without light if there was no moon and no stars. <clears throat> this is the darkest part of the evening. And it was at this point that Paul and Silas prayed. I'm here to tell you this morning, church, when it gets dark outside of your life spiritually, when there's things going on in your life that's just dark, I mean, it's the darkest point in your life, that's when you need to pray. That's when you need to sing praises to God, and that's when you need to really reach out and touch the Lord. Amen? Amen. It's at that dark point in your life, you don't run from God, you run to Him. I've always told my children, I don't care how much trouble you get in, I don't care how much bad you've done, I don't care how wrong you've been, you come to mama and daddy, you don't run from us, you let us know what's going on so we can help you. And that is God this morning. God is telling you, I don't care how many problems you've got in your life, I don't care how dark it is in your life, I want you to come to me for the answer and I will give you the solution. The Bible says when they prayed and sang praises unto God, the prisoners heard them. You know, when you get, I'm talking to the Christians now here, you know, when you get, when you get in touch with God, and you really have communion with God, and you really get plugged in to the Lord, the Bible lets you know that those around you that are still in prison will hear what you've got going on. And they'll want to come. <clears throat> 
to see what's going on with you. <coughs> what's those crazy Christians going on with you? They think you're crazy anyway. Just go ahead and fess up to it. <coughs> Own up to it, man. The world thinks you're crazy. You're not of the world. Jesus says you're not of the world. If you love the world, the Lord would love his own. The Lord don't love you. They think you're a bunch of wackos. When in actuality, they're the wackos. <laughs> Hey man, running around doing the crazy stuff they do. I mean, have you ever turned on the TV lately and paid attention to what's going on around you? All the sodomites are running around trying to get married to each other. Now they're trying to marry cats and dogs and God knows what else. And, and the news media is right on board with them and patting them on the back and saying it's okay to be queer. It's okay to get married to two men. And it's okay to be married to two women. And, and hey, if you want to uh, mutilate your body and pretend to be a man or pretend to be a woman or whatever, help yourself. And the world goes right on with that and claps their hands and praises them, gives them a award, puts them on the covers of magazines. Meanwhile, back at the camp, us Christians that are trying to do the will of God, they say, that's a bunch of crazy people over there. No, you're crazy, stupid. <laughs> I mean, anybody that tells you that you can't use pronouns to describe a male and pronouns to describe a female, you've got problems. Don't forget about all the TV shows they're putting on TV. Amen. That's right. A bunch of stuff going on in this world that the world loves. You being a Christian, you need to get in love and get in tune with God and get down interested in coming and saying, hey, what's going on over there? <laughs> we'll go check these people out for a little while and see what's going on. What makes them different? Why, why are they smiling in the midst of adversity? Something strange about those people over there, but I'm kind of magnetized to them. The Bible says the prisoners heard them. Now suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. You talk about a jailhouse rock. I mean, there, there's one for you. Elvis had no idea what he was talking about when he was singing that song, but I guarantee you there was a jailhouse rock here. The whole foundations of the prison were rocking. God knows how to get somebody's attention. The Bible says there was a great earthquake so the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened. God will open doors that no man can open in your life if you go to Him, trust Him, believe Him, and put your faith in Him. He will open the impossible for you. But you have to put your faith in Him. Again, don't run from the Lord, run to Him. He'll open those doors. Immediately all the doors will open and everyone's bags will lose. Not only will He open the doors of the prisons in your life, He will also loose those bands that have got you bound. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you have gone through. God can heal you. God can set you free. God can make you a new man. God can change you. I'm a living testimony of that, Brother Earl. There's people to this day that remember me how I used to be. Here's that. Crazy, and you, and when I tell them, well, I'm a, I'm a preacher now. You're what? <laughs> yeah, God's done something for me. I'm not that man I used to be. But I can tell you something. I can tell you how that man that I used to be became the man I am, and it's called an encounter with Jesus Christ. I had a moment where God came into my life and changed me from the inside out. I am no longer that person I used to be. I can testify to what I used to be. I can tell you what I've gone through. But I can also, and I must also, tell you what happened to me on the road to Damascus. I got struck down by the light, and the light blinded me, and I wandered around until I put 
my faith and trust in something greater than myself, greater than my circumstances, greater than my problems, greater than my addictions, greater than anything that I had going on, and Jesus changed me. He can do that for you too. Now the keeper of the prison in verse 27 awake out of his sleep. Seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword. He would have killed himself. He was scared to death. Here's all these prisoners getting out running around. <laughs> and, and according to the Roman rule of law, if you're a, if you're a jailkeeper and a prisoner escapes, hit your life for his. You get the death penalty on the spot. You didn't let nobody escape. Well, you died. The Bible says that Paul cried with a loud voice and said, Do not set the home, we're all here. He called for a light and sprang out, came trembling and fell down before Paul and said, I'll tell you, when you're real gospel of Jesus Christ is preached, people will tremble under that message. They will start paying attention to that message. And that message will get a hold of them from the heart. And it will change them. Here's what the prisoner said. He brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? There's a man that wants to know God in an intimate way, not just casually, not one of these situations where I read about God in a book somewhere, or I see God in the Constitution, or I see God in uh, the public square on the uh, plaques at the courthouse, etc. But he wants to go from knowing about God to knowing God intimately. And there's a big difference. See, there was a time in my life where I knew about God. But one day, brother, I had that encounter with God and I didn't just know about Him. I know Him personally because He lives on the inside of me. Amen. Paul says here, well, if you be a good person and join a church and uh, keep the Ten Commandments and don't slap your wife and, and uh, you know, be good to your kids and rub your dog and, and, and play with your kid cat, you know, and all that kind of stuff, you'll be a good person. You might get it. That ain't what Paul said. Paul didn't say if you quit drinking, if you quit smoking, if you quit this and you quit that, you know, you, you might get in. No, he didn't say that either. Ladies, he didn't tell you, hey, if you, if you keep your hair long and you keep your dresses long and you, uh, you keep your, uh, your, 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 your modesty about you and you get off the jury to make up and all, hey, you'll be in. No, he didn't say that either. You know what he said? He kept it simple. <laughs> he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord. You got it? What does that mean, preacher? That means you stop trusting your own righteousness to get to heaven, and you start trusting His. Amen. You put your faith in Him. You put your hands in His hands. He picks you up and carries you. So He's going to carry It doesn't matter. You're trusting Him. David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll feel no evil. Bow it with me. See, David, you got something David didn't have. That's right. David wasn't born again like you and I. He didn't have that spiritual circumcision like you and I have. He's under the Old Testament plan. You're under the New Testament plan, which means that you're not only circumcised spiritually and placed into the body of Jesus Christ, you become bone of His bone and flesh of His flesh. You are part of the body of Christ. He's a guest. And David in the Old Testament can say, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You can say that even more confidently if you're in Christ. No matter what comes on, on your path, the devil wants to kill you, no doubt about it. The devil would love nothing more than to see you dead. Why, that's, a different, that's another mouthpiece that he ain't got to worry about. 
is about death and destruction. The Bible says the thief cometh not but to steal. He will steal everything he can from you. He wants to kill. He wants to kill everything in your life. He wants to kill your joy. He wants to kill your peace. He wants to kill your happiness. He wants to kill your family. He wants to kill your job. He wants to kill you. And then after he's done that, he wants to destroy. He's out to destroy everything that he's healed. What does that mean? That means he wants to annihilate it completely in hell. He's not your friend. Don't cozy up to him. Jesus said, but I have come this is Jesus Christ now. That they might have life. That's eternal life. That's being born again. That's getting in the body of Christ and being eternally saved in Christ Jesus. He said, but not only that, and that they might have it more abundantly. God wants you to enjoy your life now with peace and joy. Amen. There's nothing worse than a Christian walking around with a frown on their face and grumpy and, and hateful and, and every time you ask them something, they got something negative to say to you. I want to be in a crowd full of people that love God and have some joy about them and are happy and excited to be saved. Amen. Now, he said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Watch it. And thy house. God will save everybody in your house if you give your heart to him. It starts with you, gentlemen. It's Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Let me tell you something. The buck stops with you. You're the father. You're the head of your house. Your wife is not the head. You are. You wear the pants. She don't. Amen. When things go south, God does not go to her. He goes to you. Oh my. <laughs> oh, the preacher started meddling now. No, sir. I'm telling you what the Bible says. The Bible says you're the head. If you put the wife as the head, you got a messed up family. It'll never work. It never does. It never has. It never will. And if she <clears throat> refuses to let you be what you ought to be, and somewhere along the line, you're probably unequally yoked. You might want to reevaluate that thing. Amen. Amen. The Bible says what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Now, I'm going to tell you something. There's a bunch of mess out here God didn't join together. That's why it don't work. Now, the brethren will be uh, mad at me when they hear that part. They will get nervous. He, is he advocate? I ain't advocating anything. I'm telling you what the Bible says. We fail to read the Bible like it says. It says what God has joined together. There's a lot of junk out here that God never put together. You need to think about that. I'll tell you this right now. If if you're saved, young man, if you're saved, dude, I don't know how many single men we've got here, and you try to date a woman that's not saved, you are disobeying God. You better find a man that's in love with God and find a man that is in love with the book and wants to do right and wants to do right for his family. That's the man you need to be looking for. Don't look for this muscle man out here that spends all his time looking in the mirror at how wonderful he is and don't care nothing about God and wants to run the streets at night. That's not the man for you, ladies. Gentlemen, let's talk about you for a minute, shall we? Too many of you men out there looking for Barbie. Amen. You need to be looking for a woman that is humble, submissive, and loves God and loves the book and is saved. Stop looking at the outer beauty only. Look at the inner beauty. 
Amen. 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 Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> they sank unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. That's important. You need to let the word of God reign in your household. You need to put that book first in your household. I didn't say take this book and beat people with it. But you need to spend some time as a family in the book. Amen. Where you have devotions where everybody can talk about the Word together. We're living in a society today that does not want the Lord in their life. Take your Bible for a minute. I'll show you what's going on. I'll show you what's going on. Here's what God says about a nation that establishes wickedness in their lives. Go to Habakkuk. Oh yeah. I'm going to the Minor Prophets Old Testament toward the back of the Old Testament right before you get to Matthew. Habakkuk. If you don't know where Habakkuk is, it's right after Nahum. It's right before Zephaniah. Get Micah, go to the right. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 4. Now, some of you may not be used to flipping through your Bible a lot. That's okay. Don't get discouraged. Stay here about six months and you'll know where to look at this Bible is by heart. I promise you. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 4. The Bible says, Therefore the law, the law is slack, and judgment doth never go forth, for the wicked doth compass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceed. Is that on America today? America is a nation that does things so corrupt, so backward. The right way to do things has been thrown out the door. The Bible says the law is slight and judgment does never go forth. When you don't judge sin for what it is, God says judgment will come to you. Let's go to Nathan. Nahum. <clears throat> Nahum chapter 3 verse 13. Nahum is right before where you were just at. Go to the left. The Bible says in Nahum chapter 3 verse 13, Behold, thy people in the midst of thee are women. I'm going to park it there for a minute. Because we need to address this. Let me tell you what this church will never be. This church will never be queer friendly. This church will never be transgender friendly. This church will never be gay rights friendly. Gay pride friendly. The Bible says, Behold, thy people in the midst of thee are women. The gates of thy land shall be set wide open unto thy enemies. The fire shall devour thy bars. What's going on in America today is we have sodomized our youth. We have sodomized our nation to the point where we have become a bunch of sodomites as a nation. And God says the enemies are at the door ready to come in and destroy you. He said, your land shall be set wide open. Hello, Mexican border. No wonder they stopped building the wall. Anybody that should, is opposed to that wall being put up don't know their Bible. Amen. Amen. There's a whole book in the Bible dedicated to a group of people that were told to put a wall up and the enemy came in and tried to discourage them from putting that wall up and they kept focused on the wall. They kept focused on getting it up because they knew that that wall didn't go up. The enemy would come in. And America
America today has had the opportunity to have a wall built up, but because of our wickedness and because of our sodomy and because of our queers and lesbians and God knows what else, the A, B, C, D, E, F, G community, whatever they are, they come in and they have got our minds brainwashed into filth. The Bible says, the fire shall devour thy walls. Here's another one. Take your Bible. Go to Obadiah. I said, good gracious, where is that at? Go to the left, right before Jonah. I'm getting into some good ones today. Obadiah chapter 1 verse 3. Look at 3 and 4. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwelleth in the cliffs of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? That was America today. I go around and preach at different places from time to time, and I tell people, America's going to follow them. You know what they say to me? I'm the truth, baby. I'll put you that'll never happen. We've got we we've, we've got too big of a military. We have got the biggest air force in the world. We've got nuclear bombs and we've got this and we've got that. You know what I'm saying? A proud. A proud. We're a nation of proud people. We've got a whole day dedicated to it. Now we've got a whole month dedicated to pride. Amen. Have you ever noticed that during the holidays we'll, we'll go over here and we'll, we'll hit Halloween and we'll make a big deal about that. We'll skip over Thanksgiving and run right into Christmas. Have you noticed that? It used to not be that way. It used to be we'd do the Halloween thing and we'd come in and we'd have a time for Thanksgiving and families would get together and they'd cook turkeys and hams and whatever else and they'd all sit around the table and they'd pray and they'd, they'd thank God for what God's blessings have been in their life. Today in America, there is no thanksgiving. Just pride. Look at who I am. Look at what I am. Look at what I've done. I'm going to tell you something. I don't care what you've got. I don't care how much you think you have. I don't care how smart you think you are. God can put you on the ground. He can humble you. He can put you to a place where there's nothing left. And then what you going to talk about? You going to talk about pride then? What do you got to be proud of? I'm going to tell you something this morning, church. I am not proud of anything except Jesus Christ. All my accomplishments mean nothing. All the things I've done are nothing. What He has done is everything. What He's accomplished is more important to talk about than anything else in the world. I ain't got nothing to talk about about me. I got to talk about him. When I talk about things that's happening in my life, I'm telling you what he has done, not what I'm doing. I boast on him. The Bible says, Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle. Huh. Isn't that interesting they use that bird? Isn't that the uh, bird for America? The eagle. Though thou set thyself uh, thy net, thy nest among the stars. Seems like we got an American flag that has stars on it. Thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. And if there's one thing I can't preach enough of in America and everywhere I go, is America better repent. I better, better get on their knees. They better get on their face before God and turn their hearts back to God before it's too late. Judgment is coming to this nation. You think the coronavirus is bad? God's got plenty more where that came from. He'll make the coronavirus look like a day in the park. 
I was sitting on the corner of Walmart there in Goldsboro, North Carolina, and Spence Avenue back in 2018, 2019, and I was preaching to those people over there, and I was warning those people something's getting ready to happen in America. It's going to shake us to our foundation, and lo and behold, Corona came. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. There's something worse than that coming. If you're here today and you know God and you believe God, God can protect you in the midst of that. But I'm here to tell you, you better know God. Got a Proverbs. That's an easy one. You know where Psalms is? That's about midway through you. I'm going to go right next to it. To the right. That's Proverbs. Proverbs 11, 11. The Bible says here in verse 11, by the blessing, by the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted. By the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted. But watch the next part. But it is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. Hello, news media. I mean, there's CBS, there's CNN, there's Fox News, there's all the rest of them. They will overthrow this nation by their filthy, dirty, rotten mouth. They hate God. Make no mistake about it. They make fun of Christians. They make fun of this book. And don't you cross them, they'll get you. They've ruined plenty of men's lives that were good men by spreading filthy lies. Don't you believe anything the press says? The Bible says over there in the Gospels when Jesus was going through the crowd, the people were trying to get to Jesus, but they were hindered by the press. Now that's prophetic. That is prophetic. Because God is letting you know right there the press is out to keep you from getting Jesus. Jesus is your best friend. Amen. Go to Proverbs 16. Moving right along. <laughs> Proverbs 16, 18. What hinders you from being saved this morning? How about your pride? <laughs> I know a lot of people I've knocked on their doors. Man, I can't tell you how many doors I've knocked on over the years. And how many people I've talked to in the grocery stores. And how many people I've talked to on the streets. How many people I've talked to in their homes. While their families are broken and their homes are broken. And they'll look at them and i say, you know what you need? You need Jesus Christ. And they'll look at me straight in my face and say, I don't need that stuff. When you try the other stuff, how's it working out for you? Amen. <laughs> How about that? Amen. The devil makes a lot of promises to get you hooked and get you in. But once he gets you in, the promises go away and the curses come on. Yeah. All the devil has to offer you is curses. But the Lord offers his blessing to you. Look at Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 18 says this. <clears throat> the Bible says, Pride goeth before destruction and the Holy Spirit before fall. Pride goes before destruction, folks. I had a young man that I was uh, talking to one time in school and I begged him. I said, man, you need to give your heart to Christ. You need to turn your heart over to the Lord. You need to trust Him. I can do it my own way. Well, I didn't know your name was Sinatra. Frank Sinatra. <laughs> yeah. You know. But I'm going to tell you, even Frank Sinatra, at the end of his life, he died a miserable death because he died without Jesus Christ. Hank Williams Sr., a man that used to sing, I saw the light, I saw the light, I saw the light. 
His limo driver said that when he was driving down the road with Hank Williams bringing into the shows, uh, he would used to try to get him to sing that song, and Hank Williams would break his teeth in the back of that limo and say, There is no light, there is no light, only darkness. He died 27 years old and went straight to hell. Let me say about it. His pride kept him from coming to it, though. He's a movie star. He's a, he's, a, he's a big musician. He's got all the fame and the fortune. But when he laid his head on his bed at night, he had no peace. Proverbs 29. Verse 23. The Bible says in verse 23, a man's pride shall bring him down low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. You know what your answer today is? Your answer is to humble yourself before God. Humble yourself before the Almighty. Acknowledge, I can't fix this. I can't save myself. I am in trouble. I need help. I need supernatural help that can only come from Jesus Christ. Only from Him. Nobody else. Only Jesus can fix it. I got news for you. <clears throat> Let's go to Isaiah 59 real quick. Some else that people use to keep them out of getting saved. Isaiah 59 verse 2. We're going to move right through these real quick. Isaiah 59 verse 2. <clears throat> verse 2. Let's look at verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But, and you better underline that but. Now God just told you, I can save anybody. I can hear anybody when they call out to me. But, your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear now, a lot of people will use their sins as an excuse to not come to God. Let me give you an example. When I go and talk to people about their souls and tell them you need to get saved, preacher, I gotta quit smoking first. Preacher, I gotta quit drinking first. Preacher, I gotta clean up first. Preacher, I gotta give this up first. Preacher, I gotta do this first. I mean, they give you a whole laundry list of things that they gotta give up in their sin life before they can come to God. And you know what I tell them? I say, if you're waiting to give up all that junk before you come to Christ, you will never be saved. What you need to do is take your dirty laundry, put it on your shoulder, and bring it and drop it at the feet of Jesus Christ and let Him clean it for you. He'll clean it. You can't. Jesus Christ is the only one that can set you free and make you free from sin. He's the only one. You can't do it. You can't quit all these things that you've got along through this stuff. You might as well just come to Him just like you are. Say, so, Lord, I can't help myself. Hey, there's a lot of Christians that have to say that to the Lord. Just because you got saved don't mean you became perfect. Just because you got saved don't mean you quit, quit doing some things that you shouldn't be doing. But what it does mean is now that you're saved, you've got an advocate, you've got somebody that can help you get through it. That's what it means. See? Don't let your sin keep you from Christ. Go to Isaiah 64, 6. There's another one. Bible says, but we are all 
as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And we do all, we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Your righteousness is as filthy rags. Stop bragging about how good you are. There's nothing good about you. If there's anything good inside of you, it's Jesus Christ. Because He is good. He's a good shepherd. He's a good God Almighty. He's good. People come to me, I tell them in prison all the time, I'm not good. I'm a bad sheep. <laughs> but Jesus on the inside of me is good. He's the one that gives me the power and the ability to be able to do what I do. Amen. I can't love people like they need to be loved. But you know what? Jesus gives me the power to be able to love them like they need to be loved. So it's His love going forth out of me. Because He lives on the inside of me. When I minister to people, I'm not ministering to them out of my own goodness. I'm ministering to them out of the goodness of Jesus Christ. Amen. Remember that when you're out there doing something for the Lord. It's not you, it's God. It's Him that deserves all the glory, all the praise, all the honor, forever and ever. Amen. Take your Bible and look at this one. The Zephaniah. All right, now we're back into Bible prophets again. It's right to the left of uh, Zechariah and Haggai. Somebody said, good God, where's that at? <laughs> it's right next door to Habakkuk. Where you at earlier with Habakkuk? Just go to the right, one page. And here's what we're going to park on for a minute. Got two more I want to really emphasize, and then we'll hit it. And we'll be done here. <laughs> Zephaniah 1, 5, 1, chapter 1, verse 5. We'll go back to verse 4, actually. I will also stretch out my hand upon Judah, for all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place, in the name of the Shemarams with the priests, and them that worship the host of heaven upon the housetops, and them that worship and that swear by the Lord, and that swear by Matham, and them that are turned back from the Lord, and those that have not sought the Lord, nor inquired of Him. I want you to look at verse 5 real carefully. You know what you're seeing in verse 5? You're seeing a bunch of people that go to church and are religious and worship, but they're not worshiping God. So you can be religious and not study. I want you to think about that. There's a bunch of religious people out here right now. There's a bunch of people that run around and talk about the Bible and, and they're religious. But when it comes right down to doing what God said to do, they have no clue what to do. They refuse to do what they ought to do. Now, I've told y'all in this church before, and I'll say it again here in this, um, in this service this morning. I am a Bible believer, yes. But I want you to understand something. Don't get so comfortable being a Bible believer that you're not a Bible doer. A Bible practicer. God wants you to be not only a hearer of the Word, but a doer. So what I mean? And being religious. See, Nicodemus came to Jesus. The Bible says he came to him at night. That's instructive. Because what is going on there, he's a religious man. But when it came down to having an encounter with God, he didn't want other people to see him. So he went at night. And he, notice the, the, the language he uses there in John 3. He says, we know that now the future comes from God. No man can do these miracles that you do. He said, God be with him. See what he's doing? No. You've been pounding about for seven years. You know what Jesus did to him? He went right through the facade. 
he went right through the smoke screen this man was trying to build religiously this man. He said, except the man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God, he cannot see the kingdom of God, and ye must be born again. He said that to a religious leader. I was out one day knocking on doors, and I was preaching, and I came across the door of this man, Brother Chuck, and this man was a deacon in a church. He had been a deacon for many, many years in this church. He was proud of the fact that he was a deacon in the church. And when I was talking to him about the Lord, I said, we're out here today sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with people. I'm not trying to get people to join my church. I mean, that's a side issue. I'm trying to get to people and find out where they are spiritually with God, where they're going to spend eternity. Are they going to heaven? Or are they going to hell? Do you know Jesus Christ? today, if you die right now, do you know where you're going to go when you die? If you don't, I can help you know from the Bible. Amen. And I asked the man a simple question. I said, if you die right now, do you know where you're going? Are you going to heaven or hell? His response to me, his response to me, when I asked him that question was, I'm a deacon in the church. That's what he said to me. And I said, I understand that, brother. That's a good thing. I'm not knocking being a deacon in church. I've got deacons in my church. I said, but that's not what I ask you. I ask you, if you die right now, do you know where you're going? Heaven or hell? He got mad at me. He said, I just, and he, he put his fist up. He said, I just told you I'm a deacon in the church. I said, that's good. I said, but let me tell you something, friend. I said, I want to give you some enlightenment. I said, there's a bunch of deacons in hell. I said, not only that, there's a bunch of preachers there too. Don't hide behind your religious cloak. You devil. You devil. You ungodly, sanctimonious, religious devil. <laughs> you must be born again. You must come to the cross. You must have the blood of Jesus Christ applied to the soul. I have a lady one time to me. She said, Preacher, I said, Sister, I said, when did you get saved? She said, I've always been a Christian. I said, You're a liar. <laughs> she said, Well, my mom and daddy were Christian. I said, That's wonderful, but you can't ride on a cocktail. <laughs> There's a bunch of preacher kids in hell, too. <laughs> You've got to have an experience with God yourself. You've got to know Jesus Christ for yourself. Or oh, it don't count. Don't hide behind mom and daddy. Don't hide behind the preacher. Don't hide behind your church denomination. Ye must be born again through the power of Jesus' name, through the blood of the cross of Jesus Christ. Say, preacher, how do I do it? I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked. First thing you must do is you recognize you're a lost sinner without hope and without God. That's your first step. <laughs> I can't save myself. I'm lost. I'm sad. I, I just can't save myself. What do I do now? I need Christ. How do I find Christ, preacher? Very simple. Go to Romans chapter 10. People complicate this. It's not complicated. It's not complicated, folks. The gospel sent it. When you start complicating it, beware. That's a Pharisee trying to get in there and mess you up. Romans chapter 10, look at verse 8. I want you to pay attention to this now. There might be some people here this morning that need this. They need to get assurance of their salvation if they don't have it. They might need to be saved if they're not saved. I can't make assumptions about people. Amen. I can't assume anybody in this church is saved this morning. I can't. I'd like to think so and so say so and so say so. But, but I don't know your heart. I don't know what's on the inside of you. God knows. You know. So listen. As they say, if the shoe fits, wear it. And if it don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> Verse 8 says, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Watch it. Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Now watch it. 
For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, there's the conversion, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, there's the sealed deal. So what does that mean, preacher? That means you get on your face before God. You say, I'm a lost sinner. I need Jesus in my heart, and I ask you, Lord, to come inside of my heart right now and save my soul. I'm from this day forward putting my faith, my trust, my everything in you, and I'm trusting you to guide my life every step of the way. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. You are going to be the Lord in my life from this day forward. Now, if you do that, you say that prayer, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you an opportunity to say that prayer publicly man, if, you, if you don't know Christ. But I'm going to tell you something. If you do that, buddy, you're just as good in heaven with the door shut. Because God saved you, He'll put you in the body, and nothing can take you out. Nothing. Not your sins, not your failures, not your weakness, not your friends, not your family, not your wife, not your husband, not your children. Nothing. When He saves you, He saves you real good. He comes on the inside of you, and He comes in to stay permanently. He comes to abide forever. And He'll give you a peace like you've never had before in your life. And He'll be with you every step of the way. And all those problems, all those issues, all those troubles, they suddenly become not that important. Because God is in control now. I want you to pray this morning with me. I want you to bow your heads. I want you to thank for a minute now. Nobody looking around. I just want you to I want to give an invitation this morning. I normally give an invitation every once in a while here when we do a service like this. Just give you an opportunity just to make sure everybody's where they need to be with the Lord. There's nobody going to embarrass you this morning. I promise you there will be nobody here to embarrass you this morning. This is between you and God. This is between you and the Lord. I want you to, I want to ask you a question this morning. Say, preacher, I don't know Jesus. As my personal Savior this morning, I'm not sure where I'm going to go when I die. I don't want that assurance this morning. And I heard you preach about heaven. I heard you preach about hell. I heard you preach about salvation. I don't want that assurance this morning. Is that you this morning? Can I, can I pray with you this morning? Just raise your hand this morning. Say, preacher, will you pray for me? I need that. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I see that hands. And God's working this morning. God's working. God's saving people this morning as we speak. He's working. And I want you to do something that may be difficult. Some people would see this as being a hard part of the service, but it's not. This is the, this is the deal right here. God loves you. He wants to save you. You've made that acknowledgement this morning that He wants to save you. He wants to be saved. I want you to step out of your pew this morning. Nobody's looking around. Nobody's going to embarrass you. Why don't you come up here in this altar this morning? I want to pray and lead you in prayer to the Lord this morning. Could you do that this morning? I'm not going to embarrass you. I want you to come on your own wheel, your own free wheel this morning. Come on. Come on. Amen. Bless the Lord this morning. Amen. Church, pray. Church, pray. All right. You come up here with me right now. Come on. Come on. Come on. I want you to pray this prayer with me, okay? In Jesus' name, say, Dear God in heaven, I ask you to come into my heart and save my soul. I acknowledge I'm a sinner. And I feel you. And I need you now in my heart. I confess with my mouth, O oh Lord Jesus, and I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. With my mouth I confess and with my heart I believe. Put my faith in you and my trust in you from this day forward. I trust you as my Savior. I'm saved. I'm washed in the blood. I'm going forward in Jesus. Amen. God bless you this morning. God bless you this morning. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, this morning. We thank you, Lord, 
We thank you. There's two more, Lord, that you put into the kingdom of God. It's been stolen out of the camp of the enemy. And are now in the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be with these two. Encourage them. Bless them. Strengthen them. Encourage them. Give them peace, Lord, like they've never had. And we know you will. We thank you for saving them this morning, Lord. May they walk in grace and walk in truth. In Jesus' name, we thank you and we bless your name, Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, we got two in the kingdom of God this morning. Amen. 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 That's what we do here. We lead people to Christ. We love them to Christ. And uh, you pray for our brother and our sister in Christ this morning. Amen. Now, we'll, we'll, we'll talk to you more about it, but um, when a person comes to Christ, they follow the Lord in baptism. Now, we've got the means to baptize everybody that comes to Christ in this church. You don't have to wait. We got a big swimming pool. And we, we got you real good. No, no problem. And we've got a horse trough as a backup. And um, we'll talk to you after service about that. Now we're getting ready to uh, uh, go and do communion this morning. And uh, I'm just excited. I am just excited this morning, folks. I'll tell you. I felt the Lord just stirring this morning in a way I just I just knew God was going to do something this morning. And God's done something here. Amen. God has done something in this church this morning. Amen. And I thank God for it. Alright, let's get ready to do our... Um, I don't even think I brought our, our communion book with us. i tell you what. Um, we're going to close in prayer right here. Give a few minutes for those that want to stay around for communion. I'll go get the book and uh, we'll work for the communion in a few minutes, okay? If you have to leave, I understand, but if not and you want to stay for communion, we'll do that in about five or ten minutes. Let's close in prayer. Brother uh, Devin, lead us in prayer, brother. I'll close in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for the Bible believing church that we can come to today and hear your word, Lord. We thank you for Pastor Mark. Thank you for the power, Lord, that you give us. Amen. Lord, we just want to say happy Father's Day to you this morning, Lord. Amen. You're the best Father that we can all ask for, Lord. Amen. Thank you that we can come to you no matter what. You can clean us up, break the bondage, sin in our life. We just come to you and confess it, Lord. You clean us up and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we thank you for that this morning, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We just ask you to continue to be with us, Lord. Help us, guide us in these coming days, these these days that are going to get harder, Lord. We just ask you to continue to guide us and help us. We just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. All right. Y'all stay around in fellowship. We got food in the back back there. I've got to go in and get the uh, communion book, and I'll be right back. And we'll start communion uh, about 15, 20 minutes on the communion service, okay? That's all it takes. I'll be right back. God bless y'all this morning. Everybody's leaving. Y'all want to hang out? Yeah, we'll go. All right. God bless you, my friend. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, too.